Good morning, everyone. This is a joint meeting between Senate Health and Welfare and Senate Judiciary Committees. It is April 16th and welcome. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about um, residential uh, care programs in the state or uh, residential programs for kids in the state and providing some oversight, trying to understand some of the issues related to our licensure of uh, residential programs for children, and then get into some of the more concerning issues that we have had before us uh, in our committees related to uh, to the Kern Hatton School, among other um, areas. So, Senator Sears, did you want to um, say yeah, anything I, before I, we started? I, I thank you for <clears throat> pretty much organizing this meeting and putting together the agenda items. I think it's important for us to understand the process of uh, residential licensing um, for um, treatment programs. Um, having run a treatment program for years, I'm familiar with licensing, but in these larger institutions. And I think I'm also need to understand what happens to Kern Hatton if the State Board of Education takes away their license and also who's overseeing what's going on right now, given that they gave away their residential treatment license. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about mandatory reporting. What appears to have happened at Kern Hatton and in other places, but um, from what we heard in testimony in Senate Judiciary when we were dealing with S99 was a failure to report by both the institution and people who work there, um, child abuse. And I, that's deeply concerning to me. Um, I don't know how much the Department of Children and Families spends each year trying to train people in being mandatory reporters. I know um, there's been a lot of interest in that. Um, and I'm really particularly, and the Senate Judiciary Committee is, wants to hear if we should improve our laws regarding mandatory reporting and what and how institutions like Kern Hatton who fail to do the man mandatory, fail to um, have mandatory reporters report incidents of child abuse, how they should be dealt with. So thank you for that. Uh, and to the to that end, the the issues that you've outlined are the very issues that we have asked first our legal counsel to um, bring to us and and talk about with us, respond to some of the questions that we've had, and then after that we'll hear from Commissioner Brown of DCF. We do not have education here with us today. It's our understanding that the education committee will be taking this up separately when the uh, AOE report is complete. Uh, but we do have uh, ledge counsel from education here. So we'll get a, a, a broader spectrum of information going forward. So uh, thank you all committee for being here a little bit early. Uh, I think we should probably uh, dive in. We've, we did ask uh, Ledge Council to respond to some of the concerns and questions that Senator Sears has enumerated. And uh, Katie, you are here. So do you, do you wanna begin or do you wanna keep with the schedule with Eric going first? It's up to you. I'm happy to kick it off. Okay. Um, Is that so okay with Eric? Yeah. <laughs> um, Katie McGlynn, Office uh -oh. of Legislative Counsel. Um, we, Legislative Counsel, was asked three questions with regard um, to Kern Hatton. And so it crossed a number of attorney subject areas. So um, there'll be four attorneys at some point kind of jumping in to answer these questions. The first question had to do um, with the current regulatory structure at Kern Hatton. So myself and uh, Jim Demeray are going to answer that. There was a question about mandated uh, reporters and when Bryn Hare is able to join us, she'll be addressing that question. And there was also a question about liability. Um, and so Eric will, will address that question. So the first question in terms of what is the current regulatory structure, it's our understanding um, that Kern Hatton held a Department for Children and Families license as a residential treatment program. 
but agreed to voluntarily relinquish that license. And as a result, DCF now has no oversight over the Kernhattan facility and no longer performs regular reviews or site visits of the facility. But uh, DCF would be involved with Kernhattan only if it received a complaint of abuse or neglect about a child who is currently or was previously at Kernhattan. In that case, DCF is still authorized to conduct investigations at Kernhattan for individual complaints of child abuse and neglect, as it would for a complaint of abuse and neglect about any child in Vermont. And then in terms of the AOE oversight, I will pass that um, question to Jim. Good morning. Uh, for the record, uh, Jim Dammer of this council. Um, so in Vermont, uh, there are two regulatory uh, oversight. Well, I should say that strongly, actually. There, there's approved independent schools, which have a higher touch of uh, regulatory oversight. And there are recognized um, uh, independent schools, which have a very, very light touch. Uh, the approved independent schools are schools that uh, have been approved by the AOE um, looking at numerous factors and um, they are able to accept public tuition dollars. Um, the recognized independent schools are, um, are able to um, count for the student in terms of truancy. So very, very light there in terms of what actually does um, is educational program at those schools has to have a minimum course of study according to the AOE rules, but basically it's a very light touch. In fact, once a recognized school applies, uh, files an enrollment notice, um, then it may provide educational services. So it doesn't even have to be approved. Uh, once it submits an enrollment notice specifying various factors, um, then uh, it is automatically able to operate unless the secretary finds an issue and then there can be a hearing about that. Um, there is no investigative authority of AOE uh, in terms of in, uh, recognized schools. Uh, aside from the hearing, there's no express uh, investigative authority as there is for approved independent schools. Um, the things that recognized uh, Independent, recognized schools have to do um, are to provide uh, training uh, of staff in uh, child sexual abuse. That's true for recognized, approved, and um, and public schools. Um, they have to do criminal background checks on employees and contractors, which is also true for approved and public schools. Uh, and they have to uh, check with the Child Protection Registry. Uh, so those they have to do. Um, and beyond that, uh, just looking at the memo for a second, uh, to point out that, um, as I mentioned, there is no express investigative authority of the State Board or the AOE looking um, at recognized schools. And there is a, is a duty of care under Title 16, um, that um, is, is to prevent exposing students to unreasonable risk, but that only applies to school districts, not to approved or to recognize uh, schools. So I guess in summary, I would just say that the, the regulatory oversight, if you can even call it that, for a recognized school is very minimal. Uh, thank you. And as, as I indicated earlier, uh, the um, Education Committee will be looking at this in information and at the, the AOE role in all of this. So, But I think it's important that we all understand the different levels of either uh, oversight or lack thereof, which we're hearing about. So, go mm -hmm. ahead, Senator Sears. And then I think Senator... Yeah, I, uh, okay. Senator Sears, I think, go ahead. I think this raises a lot of disturbing questions for all of us. Um, 
listening to the testimony on S-99, which should be coming up soon in the Senate, which is a bill that eliminates the statute of limitations on child physical abuse, we heard from survivors of Kern Hatton. Um, one woman was in her 80s. So we have this um, allegedly, uh, excuse me, this institution that has had a great deal of at least alleged child abuse going on. I don't know how much has been actually um, substantiated. Um, and now we have, we, if DOE drops out, and DOE's oversight is limited anyway, and DOE law drops out, we have no one with oversight over this institution in the state of Vermont. Um, and yet people will continue to send kids there. Um, and I, I'm really concerned about how we square that with what we've already uncovered. So, um, you know, that, Senator, that is you, you have expressed it very well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a huge concern. Uh, so I uh, will stop for a couple more questions. One, uh, Senator Nitka and then Senator White. I'm just wondering, um, could I ask a question of Jim with regard to, I didn't hear, I didn't hear if you said that the, um, in the, the uh, recognized school, if they need to check if, do they need to have fingerprints for their employees? I know you said they had to check the registry, but do they have fingerprint checks required or not? I didn't. Uh, they have criminal background checks required. Uh, fingerprint checks, I'm not sure. I have to look that up for you, uh, so Nick, give me a minute, but yeah. Um, okay. Definitely criminal background checks and definitely the res registry. Okay, Senator White. Sorry, this is a question for Jim. I, I didn't hear whether there's a difference in the independent schools of whether it's a, a residential school or just a day school. Is there a difference in, in how they're treated? Um, in terms of this uh, discussion, no. Um, they, if they're an approved school, they could be an approved school for special education. I don't think that's the case here for Kern Hatton. Um, um, I don't think they have special education students, if, if I recall testimony. Um, but in terms of recognized versus approved, um, uh, the, the, um, there is nothing around residential there. So it's basically regulation of accrued versus recognized. Okay, so just be, if it's just a day school, it would have, or if it's a residential, it would have the same um, light touch as if it were just a day school. I believe so. I see nothing in the regulations on recognized schools that distinguish between, between okay. residential and day school. Thank you. Put that way, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I think mostly of clarification at this point. Okay, um, so we can move on. Jim, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I meant to say only that the recognized schools are required to adopt um, hazing, harassment, and bullying policies are as are approved in public schools. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you. And I know that, uh, well, we'll get to our discussion with the commissioner, uh, but I do know that the Kern Hatton School did have provisions for support services, and that's something we wanna hear about from Commissioner Brown. Um, who is next? Uh, is it Eric? You And you're still muted. You're still muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, uh, continuing our discussion of some of the legal background principles uh, underlying the Kern Hatton uh, situation. I was asked to look at the potential for whether or not the state itself could be liable, uh, you know, liable on damages or uh, liable for any monetary compensation for any of the alleged abuse abuse that happened at Kern Hatton. And you know, that's really a very fact specific. Uh, question, but but it turns on sort of 
what the state's role with, was with and is continues to be, but what the state's role was with respect to current Hatton. And that, by that, I mean, you know, what what actions did the, did the state take or not take or what knowledge did the state have or not have? And that's going to be very fact specific inquiries, uh, you know, into the circumstances of what happened. I certainly don't have that information available, but I can certainly lay out the general big picture uh, legal standards that would apply in this situation so that the committee can be aware of that. Um, as a background for, for a moment, I should mention that those, those standards, those legal standards are coming from what's known as the Vermont Tort Claims Act. This is a chapter in Vermont law, chapter 189 of <coughs> Title 12. Uh, and it's a particular type of statute that all 50 states have. Uh, the federal government has it as well as the Tort Claims Act is, a, is a, a statute that essentially, through which the state says how it can be sued or how it can't be sued how it might be liable for damages, how it isn't liable for damages. It's very common, as I say, all 50 states have them. Um, and the this sort of legal standards I'm gonna mention in a moment all sort of derive from that law, from the Vermont Tort Claims Act. So uh, as I said, I think the liability is gonna turn on what the state's role was, what, what actions it took or didn't take. And um, as far as I can tell, the state's role, potential role, actual role and potential role, there's really three, three different um, uh, pieces to that. And the first, I think you've got licensing as one role that the state had, licensing and inspection. You've got um, placement, and again, potential that the state may or may not have placed, placed children at, at, at Kern Hatton, and the investigatory role, whether or not there was uh, knowledge and reports made to the state of abuse and what, what the state did or didn't do in response to that. So uh, back to the first of those three, the licensing role that the state has, I think as you've heard uh, and, and know very well, the state does have a licensing role with respect to Kern Hatton, potentially inspection role as well, but there's no liability for that. And that's a, a pretty clear point that the Vermont Supreme Court has expressly held quite clearly that uh, under the uh, Tort Claims Act, the state's role in licensing facilities, uh, inspecting facilities is not something for which they're subject for liability for damages. So that's a pretty clear answer on the licensing piece. Uh, on the, the second uh, uh, role that I mentioned, which really has to do with placement, and I, I don't know whether or not the state ever did place uh, any children that were in its custody at Kern Hatton. I don't know the answer to that question, but, it, but if the answer is yes, if, if the state did place children there, then, um, and they did so, then it turns on, well, what was the state's knowledge at the time? Was there some knowledge that either the state actually had or could be charged with having, in other words, that they should have known based on the facts and circumstances involved, if there was some knowledge that abuse had been occurring and the state still placed children there, despite having that knowledge, there is a potential for liability. That would be, uh, you know, if you think about it, it's you know, the sort of general tort claims of, uh, you know, uh, violating a duty of care or disregarding a risk of harm, those sorts of principles that apply in the in the civil liability context that would obviously potentially um, be an issue if the state had knowledge that there was abuse going on and, and placed children there despite that. So that's one possibility is the is the placement issue. And the, and the last one really has to do with the investigatory role of the state, right? So if, if reports of abuse are made, the state has an obligation to investigate them. So the question is, again, factual question, I don't know the answer to, were reports of abuse made to the state contemporaneously with it occurring? Now, that's a historical question. I don't know the answer to that. But again, um, if, if, that, if the answer to that question turns out to be yes, if it turns out that yes, reports were made, um, uh, then the possibility of the state having liability turns on how the state responded. How did the state react to those reports? If uh, and, the, and the Vermont Supreme Court happens to have addressed this exact issue as well with, with respect to child abuse reports. And, and the, the answer that gave really was, um, if, if the state responds to those reports by not investigating at all, in other words, uh, report of child abuse is made, state doesn't investigate, there's a potential for liability in that situation, possible civil liability on, on the part of the state. On the other hand, if the state did respond, and do some investigation. And, and the claim is just that the response was inadequate or in some way uh, uh, not what it should have been. In that case, actually, there is no liability. That that's, falls under what's known as the discretionary function exception 
to the State Tort Claims Act. In other words, the, just alleging that someone didn't, in a matter of which over which the state actor had some discretion how to respond, um, there's a specific exception for that in statute, as opposed to not responding at all. You know, in that case, there'd be liability because there's, you know, no discretion involved in failing to respond. Let's say there's a legal obligation to at least respond somehow. So, um, sort of recapping, then you've got, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, all this potential for state liability is something that has to be developed over time through facts, but. But uh, with respect to the state's licensing role, does not appear to be any potential for liability. With respect to placing children at the facility, if the, if, they, if the state did place children there with knowledge that their abuse had occurred, then there's a possibility of liability there. And if reports of abuse were made to the state uh, and the state uh, didn't respond at all, again, possibility for liability there. But if the state did respond, uh, in some way, then probably no liability based on sort of the adequacy or manner in which they responded. That's a summary. I should sit, point out that overlaying all of this is a point that Senator Sears made earlier, which is that uh, all of this also uh, is very much connected to the statute of limitations. So in other words, when did the alleged abuse occur? Uh, because it's a very, you know, very strong possibility that the older these cases are, they would be barred by the statute of limitations anyway, depending on what kind of uh, abuse it was. So you may recall that a couple of years ago, the legislature passed a statute that repealed the statute of limitations for claims of childhood sexual abuse. Remember, we passed that so that, and that was retroactive. So if, if any of these claims involve sexual abuse, there's going to be no issue with the statute of limitations because of the law that the legislature passed two years ago. Um, that those can be brought at any time, whenever the victim is is ready to bring the suit. However, if if it's physical abuse of a non-sexual nature, uh, that has a three-year statute of limitations. So those could, those had to be brought. And I should point out too that those sorts of claims, uh, the statute of limitations does not run while somebody is a minor. So the three-year statute of limitations for a child victim wouldn't start running until the child turned eighteen. So the child would have uh, until they turned age 21 uh, to bring suit based on, on physical abuse, some sort of physical injury a, a not of a non-sexual abuse nature. But that may have passed. That clock may have passed for many victims, depending on when this occurred. So um, as Senator Sears mentioned, there's a bill that the Senate Judiciary Committee passed out last week or the week before, I can't recall now, uh, that repeals the statute of limitations uh, in the same way that the, the law did that you passed two years ago for child sexual abuse claims, this repeals it for child physical abuse claims. So that would permit um, victims of physical abuse going forward, if it passes, obviously, um, that would permit these claims to be brought, if there is a claim, um, anytime in the future uh, without having the claim barred by the statute of limitations. So that's sort of a, cons uh, a point to keep in the background of whether or not the state has any liability because it obviously will turn on that as well. Eric, thank you. Uh, that's very clear. I mean, uh, this is an issue I think that our committee has, um, uh, will want to dive into uh, thoroughly and in understanding how those uh, complaints of abuse are made through our through district offices, and then the frequency and intensity of those complaints, I guess, would be important for determining uh, whether or not the state has acted um, appropriately in its response. Yes, that's right. Okay. All right. So, uh, any questions of clarification for for Eric on this in this area? This this is an area that's going to take some time to to go through. Uh, I think in our committee in particular, and then it will um, it'll spill over into the other committees. No question about it. Uh, Jim, do you want to respond to um, Senator Nika's question? <coughs> question about fingerprints. Um, they are, are required by public schools, um, approved independent schools, and recognized schools have to get uh, fingerprints for employees and contractors. Contractors. <coughs> Very much. All right, thank you. Eric, thank you. Uh, you you turned your, your picture off, but we appreciate sure. you appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Happy to help, sure. Okay, and I think um, 
Uh, Bryn is next. Is Bryn, where'd Bryn go? Where did Bryn go? She left. Who's next, Katie? Um, I believe the last question was the mandated reporter's question and Bryn had planned to address that. Um, it may have been that we had scheduled from 8.30 to 9 and she may have had another commitment to another committee at nine o'clock. I'll email her and check okay. in. Okay. I think because this is an area that both of our committees have significant concern about and the, uh, and we've worked, uh, we worked several years ago on the mandatory reporter law and statute. Uh, so knowing who is responsible for making reports, how those reports are made, and then the consequences of not reporting um, are uh, critical to understanding Kern Hatton. Senator Sears, I know this is a, yeah, big, a big area for you. So why don't you um, go ahead? Yeah, I, and, and I, I do want to add, and I did speak with Commissioner Brown about this this morning um, and have spoken to him in the past about it. it. We are getting bombarded in Senate appropriations, and you may be as well, on emails from people urging us to fund $117,000 um, for prevent child abuse from Vermont for training and man for mandatory reports. And I know the department has been putting a lot of effort into training um, to make sure that mandatory reporters are doing their job. And we'd rather have them err on the side of caution and maybe report something um, that they suspect include child physical um, and this all started back uh, during the Desiree Sheldon case, if you remember, years ago, a young girl from the Rutland area who was um, murdered, and there had been evidence that she had had a series of child abuse cases with broken arms and so forth. So I've got to take care of the dog. Um, okay, and I think... I'll be right back. Thank right. You. So, but the the issue you raise about within the uh, big bill on uh, uh, our our prevent child abuse uh, coalition providing training for for reporting is, um, and I did I did see I did hear from Commissioner Brown about that. So I, I will I know it's I know it's happening, but the more it happens, the better. Uh, so the more training we have for folks on how to report, when to report, and the frequency of reporting, I think, is going to be very important going forward. So uh, I see that Bryn is doing a walkthrough in um, another committee. So what we'll do is we'll shift over to DCF. And uh, Commissioner Brown, thanks for being here uh, with half of your team. Uh, I know that the other half is unable to be here. But our, our questions really relate to the process for uh, granting and revoking a residential treatment program license uh, as, uh, and not a, not a real surf, sur, surper, sorry, superficial review, but rather some depth uh, as much as we can get today. And then um, walk through how a complaint concerning a Kern Hatton student might be addressed, uh, how that complaint might be addressed under the child abuse and neglect um, process, uh, because we're hearing that that is very important and how ma mandatory reporting occurs through DCF. So those are the two areas to begin with, and then we'll, um, we'll move on from there. So thank you for being here, Commissioner. Yes, good morning. And, um, and as I had indicated earlier, uh, Jennifer Benedict, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. Um, uh, and we hope she recovers quickly. Um, and with me, I do have our general counsel, Jennifer Micah. We do have a short PowerPoint that will kind of highlight some of the overview processes th that we can discuss in a little more detail. And Jennifer will walk us through that, and then we'll be able to um, answer your questions as well um, as, as we go through it. And um, and, and just, just you know, for, for the committees, uh, as uh, we indicated earlier, the goal here is to understand what improvements we can make 
to the to the process. So as we learn more about what has happened with Kern Hatton, then each of our committees will make recommendations, statutory um, recommendations to improve the process. Thank you. Go ahead. Do you, are you do you have share screen? Um, I believe um, Nelly was going to pull it up and walk it, and and uh, Jennifer walked us through it. Okay, Nelly, you're all set then. Yep, I'm all set. Um, I will bring that up. Shall I step in now, John? Sure, please, Jennifer. This is Jennifer Micah, General Counsel for Vermont Department for Children and Families. Um, before I start, I do want to um, remind the committee of the limitations of my expertise in this area. Jennifer Benedict is the supervisor of the RLSI. She's the director of the RLSI division, and she really is the one with the expertise. So I'm gonna, this is going to be fairly broad, um, but I think the biggest mistake I could make today is in misrepresenting um, how the uh, RLSI operates. So I'm, I apologize if you're unsatisfied with my answers and we will try to get you the answers that I can't answer today. But we can go through it on a, on a um, sort of overview and um, take back any specific questions to Jennifer when she's feeling better. So we can go to the next slide, please. So there, before I start, there are two, two things that DCF does. One is we investigate individual allegations of abuse and neglect. That happens throughout the state in any situation where we get a call of um, abuse or neglect of a child. The other one is our licensing function over residential treatment programs. Those overlap sometimes because our, our licensing implicates um, uh, child safety. So we license and regulate our, our T, we call them RTPs, residential treatment programs, foster homes, kin homes, agencies that place children um, and uh, designated shelters for uh, young adults. Special Engage Investigations Unit does the child safety and interventions, which are the assessments and investigations which that is the situation where you have a, an allegation of abuse or neglect. Okay, we can go on to the next slide if there aren't any questions yet. This is the organization chart. Uh, Jennifer, what I'm gonna say is because I can't see everyone. And so if a committee member has a question of clarification, then please just speak up and, um, and offer your question. Thank you. You can see we have a number of, of the FSW means family services worker, and we have them throughout the state, and they investigate in their region, <clears throat> in their regions. In addition to having a um, a main number that uh, people call for a particular um, allegation. And I would point out in in response to um, some of the concerns raised by Senator Sears regarding uh, mandated reporter functionality uh, functions and uh, training that we have two staff in this unit who do take on the responsibility of providing um, mandated uh, training to uh, residential programs. So they're fully aware of their obligation on, under the law of how that works. I think we can go to the next slide, please. So this is an area that I am not um, knowledgeable in the application process for a residential treatment license. So unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to wait for Jennifer Benedict to come back and give you an overview of that particular process. But what I could say is that, you know, under um, uh, Title 33, um, we're required to promulgate um, rules regarding the regulation, regulation of residential treatment programs for Vermont youth. Um, and we can provide those regulations to the committee. Um, the link to them on our website, um, about 50 pages of, of regulations of how 
you know, uh, you become a licensed and, and, and how we regulate those pro programs as well. Um, and so we could refer to the, be able to refer to those throughout question, questions as well. So let me ask this question. Uh, when was the last time that the handbook and the rules were um, re-evaluated and updated? I'll have to get back to you on that question. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I know because sometimes we, we hear that rules have been in place for 20 years and without review. So it would be helpful for us to know uh, where the where these rules are and where the um, where the information is for providers. We can get that to you. The one thing I want to point out around around the RTP is that the fact that you have an RTP an RT, a residential treatment a program license does not mean that every child in the facility is in need of residential treatment services. So you could, you could be licensed and, and as with Kern Hatton, only have a very small number of children who fit within the, um, the needs that a treatment program would provide. The, the, um, pro the, I'm not saying this clearly, but children with higher needs who need a treatment program, um, that's the reason why you might have a license. But if you didn't have a lot of children, who needed that kind of treatment, then you wouldn't need the license and you might be more willing to let the license go, which removes DCF from the uh, oversight of that facility. And that's the case with Kern Hatton, that they only had a small number of children who needed a residential treatment program. It was by and large, simply a, a residential school. So, the, so then the question arises, uh, while DCF did provide oversight through licensure, uh, what was the nature of the treatment programs available to the few kids who were there? And then what is the number of children, what's the cutoff point? <laughs> you know, if you have one child who needs support, um, that child needs support. So um, that, that's a question. And then the other question I would ask is, um, and as we go forward, we'll have to hear more about this, but uh, are those kids still in the school who are DCF uh, kids in school, state-sponsored children still at Kern Hatton? So th that's maybe, Commissioner, you can answer that. Uh, I can answer, we, we do not have any um, uh, children or youth um, in the custody of the Department for Children and Families placed at Kern Hatton. And then the other question would be, how many kids are there who require treatment currently? So we'll, I mean, we'll have to dive into some of this a little more in detail to understand exactly what happened when the licensure was ended. And we don't, I don't have the numbers of, of how many children need treatment who are still there. It could be that parents could choose to leave a child there even if they needed treatment um, but that's not something I can answer today. So we'll have to get back to you on that particular question too. And the other questions about the, the actual programs, those are not, those are really questions for the expertise of Jennifer Benedict. Okay, thank you. I apologize for that. I know it's don't, frustrating. Don't apologize. You can't apologize for someone being sick. <laughs> thank Senator you. Sears has got his hand up. Go, just go yeah. ahead, Dick. Yeah, yeah I, I do. And it's a little bit beyond the application process, but when I was operating 204 Depot, social workers were required to visit once a month with placed children. I don't know if that's still a requirement, but part of that conversation with their kid was often the kid would report things, a social worker would come to me or another staff member and discuss the concerns and then um, sometimes there were actual, um, you know, reports. Other times it was cleared up uh, between the kid and the staff member or myself. I'm, I'm wondering if that's still the case, number one. And number two, are, um, did you get reports regarding current Hatton from social workers who visited there? And would that bring another licensing visit I don't know the answers to those questions. We'll have to ask Jennifer Benedict about those. 
Uh, I do know we, Depot, I, Depot I, certainly I, would have more oversight. We, I mean, DCF would be more involved in Depot because of the nature of the program more than Manhattan. But we do, and we do regularly have social workers visit when we have a child in custody. Yeah, and they are so, still required to meet once a month um, with with their with their with the children on their caseload. But the reason for my question, and it's similar to the question that I had that I had discussion with Colonel Birmingham about, and that is when a kid runs away frequently, if he's picked up or she is picked up by law enforcement, there's often a discussion with the law enforcement officer about the conditions that. So I don't know if any of those reports. So maybe you could check with um, check uh, on that as well. And I can ask her. I'm sorry, Senator. You, you were going in and out. It was hard for me to understand. Oh, I'm sorry. My Here question. Yeah, my question really is um, those conversations when a kid runs away. There were a number of there's allegations that during the Mark, I think his name was Mark Davis era at Kern Hatton, that Phillips. a number of children ran away. This all came up during our testimony on S-99. They would run away, be picked up and returned by the same trooper. And, and my experience is that when kids run away, they often talk to whomever picks them up, whether it be a trooper or a social worker or a staff member and say something about conditions. And it's alleged that those kids talked about the abuse that they were afraid of. And um, well, that's what I wanted to, that, yeah, that's so my, that, You're right, uh, this is a question that we asked when we heard from uh, Kern, the Kern Hatton fo yeah, uh, lawyer right. early on and we're still waiting for a response about that. So it would be helpful to know how that information from a public safety officer is treated and whether it actually makes its way, um, especially if, if, it's a, if it's a child under custody, but also if it's a child in a licensed facility, where does that information go? How is it treated? I would think it would be reported to our um, well, we, we, reporting I number. Guess, but I uh, guess the, the direct question is, was it, was it? reported. We, so, and, and if I could just jump in here, I think what we would need is more um, information on the dates and timelines for us to go back to, on some of these questions to, to check whether certain information came in through um, our child safety intervention um, process or, or through the regulatory process as well. Because um, it could have come in through a, mo a couple different avenues depending on um, you know who reported it and how it was reported to us. Whether it was our so one of our social workers conducting a visit, um, whether it was law enforcement um, based on their interactions with youth or the program, or or parents or staff as well. And so we, you know we would just need more details to be able to um, um, look into our records to make those those type of determinations. Okay. You can, uh, why don't you just keep going? Okay. Next slide, okay. please, Millie. So this is another area where I, I do not have the expertise to go through this in detail. I can tell you um, pertinent to the current Hatton matter, when we get an investigation, when we get a report, we do investigate and we have several potential outcomes, which are the person, the institution is in compliance, there are no violations, they're not in compliance, in which case we try to encourage them to get into compliance and we offer them our expectations and um, opportunity to improve through a corrective action plan, or we notify the program um, and then we also notify the program of our findings, both verbally when we're doing this visits and in writing. Um, and the regulatory interventions are reviewed at each licensing renewal, which is as Jennifer Benedict talked about at the last meeting um, every two years. Next slide.
So I'm not going to try to go through this um, flow chart with you. Uh, this will be something that Jennifer Benedict will have to go through with you, um, but it does show what happens when we get an intake. Um, and it's, it'll be important when Jennifer Benedict comes back to talk to you about uh, why we accept and not accept certain kinds of claims. Relevant to the current Hatton case here that we're talking about the current Hatton matter that we're talking about, um, most of the recent allegations regarding Kern Hatton involved child on child um, activity. There are historical claims of adult on child um, abuse, but when you get into issues around children, there are issues of consent and not consent and children behaving in the way children do sometimes inappropriately, but not necessarily abusively. So it, it can be tricky to decide what, what's happening when you have two children um, engaging in, in sexual activity. Um, so that, but that is the crux from DCF's perspective of, of the problems that we're facing in trying to regulate and license Kern Hatton and other, and, and other schools of, of you know, residential schools, especially. So we'll bring Jennifer Benedict back when you're ready to have her go through the, the details of how we do this. And, and well, I would it, point out that, that this flow chart is for the child safety interventions, what we would refer to as the chapter 49 investigations and not a regulatory um, um, matter uh, under their license and regulate responsibility. But this would be um, how we investigate specific allegations of child abuse. And we receive tens of thousands of, of these referrals a year through our centralized intake unit where all of those uh, uh, come into our uh, the department. Madam so it Chair. also, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, I'll ask mine and then Senator Hardy, you're up mm -hmm. next. Um, but it also brings to mind the question about how the um, policies and investigatory processes are uh, in the residential facility itself. So the does DCF review, and that's on your earlier slide, and maybe Jennifer, Jennifer Benedict can help us with this. What's the process internal to the to Kern Hatton, for example, when uh, a complaint is made? Right. So we'll have to wait for Jennifer Benedict to talk more in detail about that. But I will say, um, piggybacking on what the commissioner said, some of these intakes do then also get referred to licensing if we feel that there might be a violation of the licensing regulations as a result of, uh, for instance, um, failure to supervise. So that would be a super, that would be a regulatory matter versus the child on child activity that we might be investigating in our RLSI, uh, excuse me, in our, in our um, what we call the child safety intervention investigations. It will, but it might be, it might, a policy in place might prevent some of the abuse that would, might, or the interaction child to child that might occur. So we'll have to yeah. just look at that a little bit. Senator okay. Hardy, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Jennifer, you may have just sort of answered what I was going to ask, which was, um, I understand the complexities of investigating or um, uh, getting to the bottom of child on child um, sexual contact, contact. but um, is it true that if an adult or a teacher or residential care provider knows about the contact and doesn't do anything about it, is there not some kind of liability or responsibility for that adult to as you said, super supervisory ability or reporting or intervention um, responsibilities for the adult in the situation. Yes. So we're getting into where DCF um, would like to talk about some of what we see as gaps in the in the um, oversight of some of these schools. And I'm not DCF doesn't think that it is really necessarily the right uh, department to oversee some of this, but let's say uh, just as an example you have a school where children are engaging in um, what might be considered inappropriate sexual conduct with each other it is the 
adult's responsibility to make sure that the children are kept safe. Now, in a home, if there were, if there were a parent who was failing to protect children from each other in their own home, you could have an investigation and a charge of child abuse and neglect for failure to protect those children. Um, in, an, in an institution, it's much harder to get at because there isn't always an identified adult that you can point to who is failing to protect. So um, you, you might have an institution that has, for instance, um, cabins where, where children are um, engaging in inappropriate conduct and you might know that the adult is supposed to be there and they're not. And that might be an easy case where you can point to that particular house parent who wasn't there. But in another case, you might have children sneaking off into an auditorium or going into the woods or um, going into places where they're not supposed to be, where there's ambiguity about which adult is supposed to be supervising at any given time. So those are essentially the problems that we're facing in, uh, in investigating and trying to hold accountable institutions for failure to protect, which I think is what a lot of, is what, which I think is what's going on um, to some extent uh, at Kern Hatton. How do you, how do you make sure that the adults are, that there are a sufficient number of adults um, and that they're watching the children where they need to be watched? Senator um, Long. Oops, I'm sorry. Jennifer. No, that's fine. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, with regard to the the child on child activity, if a child complains to an adult, then what's the process? So the the adult, the mandated reporter, should call our hotline and report the abuse, the the activity, and the, and there will be um, and. I don't want to, I can't get into the details of it because I haven't been involved in that process, but as a mandated reporter, which is any, any adult who's working at a school is a mandated reporter. So they should be reporting it. And we would then, as the, the flow chart shows, we will accept it or not accept it um, based on the facts of the initial case. If it's a particularly serious case, we might get law enforcement involved too. And I think depending on the nature of, of that institution where that occurred, if it's a licensed residential, um, it could be referred for a regulatory intervention as well as a, a, um, a child safety intervention investigation as well. I think it's, it's a fact specific depending on the circumstances involved, um, you know, with, with the conduct who's involved in the conduct and then also um, the nature of, of, of the institution where it occurred. Right. As I noted earlier, if you are an institution that doesn't need the children who need residential treatment, then you don't need a license and then you avoid that kind of oversight. Uh, thank you. This is great. Um, let's, let's, why don't we move on to your identified gaps that you were talking about and then, okay. <clears throat> um, We'll open up for further questions. So we've talked about, we've I've talked a little bit about our regulatory oversight limitations. If we, if they don't, if they don't need, if it's not, if they don't want to be a residential treatment program, then we have no oversight of them on a licensing, on a licensing matter. We have no authority to close them. Um, nobody does really as far as I can tell. Um, maybe Jim Demaray can talk, speak to that more, but I don't think there's any authority that would allow us or AOE to close an institution. Um, I don't, I apologize. I don't understand that, that second point. I, I would, didn't do the um, PowerPoint and I'm not sure what Jennifer was, Jennifer Benedict was intending with that second one. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Right. There are, we did hear about national or, or more regional uh, regulatory activities 
through the AOE. So maybe that's, we'll, we'll come back to that at some point. National yeah. accreditation that might be out there for like independent schools. We're not yeah. able to share certain information, I believe is the point there, but we would need Jennifer to confirm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, DCF has not revoked an RTP, a residential treatment program license. Um, and part of the reason we don't, we didn't want to revoke Kern Hatton's license is because we understood that we were providing some oversight um, in a situation that we were concerned about. And <laughs> I don't know what more to say about that, but- Well, um, I don't, I don't know, but that leaves um, those of us who may be sitting here hearing that leaves us with dozens of questions I'm sure. About I'm what sure. that means. Um, we decided not to take it because maybe you could rephrase that or. or so, Senator, I guess how, how I would frame it for the committee is you know, we had been engaged with Kerr and Hatton, and, and this is historical, uh, you know, prior to the uh, general counsel, Micah, of my time. But um, I, as I uh, came into this role, this is one of the first issues I faced this summer um, was how to move forward with Kern Hatton based on our concerns with their program over the last several years and concerns that they really uh, were more of, an, of a private boarding school than a, than a treatment program and really shouldn't be licensed um, and that you know, there were ongoing issues with them um, and, and what was happening with kids in their program. And so from our perspective, you know, the, the department that's responsible for child protection issues, our one tool in our toolbox was to close their residential license. And if we invoked that one tool we had, we lost ongoing visibility into that program on an ongoing basis, unless we received a specific child safety report invoking our chapter 49 authority to do a specific in investigation. However, that would only be specific to that, that, in that, in that report of abuse or neglect. Um, and so our ability to um, provide any oversight to that program on an ongoing basis um, evaporated as soon as we closed their license. And oh. so we were, in a catch-22 at the time, I would say. So it, 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 if I compare that, where Kern Hatton is today, with say uh, Vermont Academy in nearby Saxon Rivers, <clears throat> you have no uh, authority over uh, Vermont Academy, nor yet, I don't think the state ever has, other than if there was, was a report of child abuse there, you would obviously have to investigate. Um, is that correct? That is correct, Senator. Yeah, that helps me a lot because I'm comparing the two programs today. Um, if 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 Kern Hatton loses the state board of education designation, then they would be more like current, uh, Vermont Academy, which I don't think is recognized by the state board of education. And I might add, if you have a lot of out-of-state students then the AOE designation isn't as important to you either. Yeah. So then, I mean, that raises a huge number of questions about uh, oversight period. And uh, this can go on and on and where the responsibility lies because these are children. So, um, and, and then just to go back to your number one, uh, the, the first bullet that you have there, uh, where you're closing the license or revoking the license, um, the oversight that was provided was a result of kids, state children being placed and or treatment uh, necessary for kids. So if the treatment continues, whatever that is, whether mental health or uh, behavioral treatment, what, why isn't there some, well, should there be, from your perspective, be some oversight for those kids in treatment? 
to ensure that the treatment uh, services are offered adequately. So uh, I'm not sure how to answer that um, other than to say if pa parents have a choice where to send their children um, and if they go to a school that chooses not to be licensed as a treatment program, but they're happy with what the school is offering their child, then you get into issues about um, the rights of parents to, to choose the education for their children um, as just one point. I mean- uh, and, I, and I would say uh, when we were working with Kern Hatton, recognizing, I think they recognized that they really were not a residential treatment program. Um, and we had recognized that and we had concerns about the way they were operating and we were moving towards um, revoking their license when they voluntarily said they wanted to relinquish it. Before we would allow them to do that, we required them to take certain steps to make sure that um, surrounding states who might refer children to their educational institution um, were made aware that they were not a licensed residential treatment program and treatment was not a component of their program. Because as, as uh, General Counsel Michael indicated, um, uh, you know, they do receive a, a number of students from surrounding states um, into their program. And we wanted to make sure those states and other um, organizations that refer children there were aware that they were no longer a licensed treatment program nor and did not provide treatment that they were solely an educational institution. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions at this point for um, Senator Senator Hooker. or Commissioner yes. Brown? Go ahead. Senator Hooker has a question. Thank you. Oh, thank thanks. You. Go ahead, go ahead. Commissioner, Commissioner Brown, you said that um, Kern Hatton relinquished their license, but that you were in the process of revoking it. And can you address that? I mean, what, why, why was there that revocation that was imminent and then the um, relinquishing instead? Well, you always, if, 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 you know, when you're working with a, another entity, you know, whether it's in this area of DCF or other areas, you certainly want to come to a resolution by agreement, um, uh, if at all possible. And in our work with Kern Hatton, um, and, and our, our continuing regulatory findings of, of that we were, um, and our concerns of of their treatment program, which we didn't think they, they met the, the criteria any longer to be a, a licensed treatment program. And they agreed, and then they had agreed that they, that instead of, you know, um, and, and they agreed and recognized that and said that we would like to voluntarily relinquish, but we wanted to make sure they met certain conditions before that happened. Had they not met those conditions, we would have then moved forward in a timely way. We would have moved forward at that point to revoke their license and then ourselves notified other organizations that they were no longer a licensed treatment program. Um, but Kern Hatton was able to meet those conditions um, and then voluntarily surrendered their license. And so I think that that, that, that was the mechanism that moved forward. So when we bring Jennifer Benedict back in, uh, will she be able to ask more in-depth question, uh, question, answer more in-depth questions about this particular issue? Because it's a, it's one that um, I'm very concerned about, and I think other members of our committees are concerned about. Yeah, it, and and I think, and that's the gap we identified, Senator, is we were concerned yeah. too, recognizing um, what was happening in their school. Um, but that they also weren't a treatment program. And our only tool in our toolbox was to close their license, which shut the door to our ongoing um, oversight role of that, of, of that institution. But you indicated that they would have had to meet certain uh, conditions. So it would be helpful to us to understand what those conditions sure. are or sure. were. Yep, and we, have the, and we can provide the documentation of, of the correspondence that we provided to Kern Hatton with those with those conditions in it, Senator. We do have that um, documentation. 
thank you. Okay, any other questions? I can't see hands. Senator Sears, I can see. Yeah, um, I just um, wanted to thank Commissioner Brown and, and uh, the others from DCF. And it's unfortunate that <clears throat> her name right now, I'm stumbling. Um, Jennifer but, uh, Benedict, thanks. that's okay. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer Benedict was un <laughs> unable to join us today. Um, I think that you actually uh, explained a lot, but also left a lot um, of information. And I think um, there may need to be significant changes in the way we license <clears throat> independent schools. Um, and when I thought, think of an independent school, I think of Burn Burton, and I'm sure people from the kingdom could. Um, you know, Linden Institute and some of those other schools, not necessarily um, residential school uh, like Kern Hatton. <clears throat> so uh, it leaves with a lot of questions, but I think also um, you've explained a lot too to help me understand a little bit of the process. I'm hoping that Colonel Birmingham can shed some light on some of the other issues. So, I, so I think point. Senator Hardy has a question uh, and sure. then, go ahead, Senator Hardy, and then, then I'll have a question for you, Senator Sears. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, Commissioner, I'm wondering if, given everything that you've learned and processed and shared with us, if you have specific recommendations for what we should be doing moving forward to improve the legal structure, given that that's what what we're able to do is make laws, change laws, um, and and I I had hoped to see a slide that sort of had your bullet point recommendations, and I'm wondering if if you've gotten that far. I mean, it seems clear to me that there are certainly recommendations about private school oversight, which is obviously not in your um, bailiwick. But if there are things in your area that you think we should tighten up legally, um, what would they be? I think, you know, and I would de defer to Jennifer Micah to jump in here, but I think, you, you know, there's the issue of the one tool in our toolbox is, is closure. So I think <coughs> if, if there is a residential treatment program and there's ongoing compliance issues, and we certainly would not want to just close their license and lose visibility and, and access to that program on an ongoing basis, you know, I think we would want to explore what opportunities are there maybe to expand our, our our capabilities there or tools in our toolbox. But I think also in general, I think J Jennifer touched on the other point, like if if, if, if this was a private home and, 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 and it was uh, youth on youth, um, you know, the parent would, would be as ultimately responsible for their children. And, and, you know, in many times we do act in those situations um, either through a con conditional custody order or a family support case or we take them into custody and place those children in another setting. And we have that ability to do that. We didn't have the ability to do that here. And I think Jennifer touched on that a little bit um, uh, on how, how we would intervene in these situations that could be ongoing of um, ch children on children abuse occurring and, and who do we hold accountable? Is it, is it the staff? Uh, are there staffing pattern issues that are actually um, problematic of leadership and resources in the institution, and that's where the accountability lies. I think those are questions that need to be fleshed out and explored more. Is are there opportunities to 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 look at for us there as well? But I'm also sensitive that in the other chamber right now, there's a conversation going on with a child advocate where there's been a lot of testimony that we overreach and and are too intrusive and too quick to act. And so I think that highlights for us you're sensing our hesitancy here that we want to be careful because we do have an awesome responsibility here. And at times we have some pretty broad powers. And, and when you exercise those, sometimes it creates conflict. And, 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 um, and, and I think we're seeing that in between the, the testimony and the office child advocate, but then also the flip side here, um, you know, in, in, in this situation. And so we're sensitive to that, to that tension and we just want to uh, approach it thoughtfully. 
that I completely appreciate that and understand that you're in a really difficult <laughs> situation. And also it seems to me with the residential care treatment facility situation, you're kind of in a catch 22 also that if you revoke a license, you have no oversight, but if you allow a program that shouldn't be a facility, a program to continue, then you're also not doing the right thing. So what is the right thing to do there? So I appreciate that. I think though, that we do want to move forward with something, at least as we flesh this out to improve the system that makes it clearer for you all and also more um, protective of children in the state and these kinds of programs. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner. I'll echo uh, Senator Sears' comments um, and, and Jennifer. Um, this has been very helpful. It's again, it's, we're getting further down the tip of the iceberg. So, and we will, we'll come back to this again. So, but thank you very much. Uh, so Senator Sears, my question is we have both Matt Birmingham and uh, Bryn Hare here. And I've, I was thinking that perhaps we should go to the mandatory reporter re, uh, report, uh, Bryn's report first, and then um, Colonel Birmingham, but I'll leave it to you. And you're muted, Senator. Sorry, my life on Zoom is muted <laughs> at the time. And when I don't want something I say heard, I'm not muted. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, um, I'm fine with, uh, I just wanna make sure we have adequate time for Colonel Birmingham. So, um, yes, so let's do this. Let, let's listen to Bryn and we'll try to restrain ourselves with, with questions and dis comments uh, and sort of listen, and then we'll move to yeah, Colonel Birmingham. We're scheduled Birmingham. To, to break at 10. I mean, we can go a little bit longer than that. Okay. Kind of judiciary. Yeah, we're, we're, we're tight as well. So um, Bryn, welcome. We're, Thank we, you. We, 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 I think we asked a question about um, uh, mandatory reporters and what happens with a failure of mandatory reporting. So perhaps you could sure. speak to that a little bit. Sure. And my apologies, I had to leave earlier, um, but that's the way it goes. So it's good morning. Time of year. Um, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, for the record, here to talk about. Um, what happens if a person who's a mandatory reporter fails to report. <clears throat> um, so as everybody knows, there's, a, there's an obligation in Title 33 for uh, mandatory reporters to report to any um, reasonably suspected child abuse or neglect to the Department uh, for Children and Families within 24 hours that that abuse was first uh, received or observed. So a failure to report um, child abuse and neglect by a mandatory reporter, it, it is a misdemeanor. Um, the statute, the mandatory reporter statute, provides for a $500 fine um, for a person who violates the requirement, um, and also an enhanced penalty of, a, of up to a six-month prison sentence and up to a $1,000 fine for a person who fails to report um, with the intent to conceal child abuse or neglect. Um, so there, there is a <clears throat> criminal penalty directly in the mandatory reporter statute. Um, and then also, and this is, I can speak to this more generally. There's also, uh, depending on the employer of the mandated reporter, there could also be um, employment sanctions for a failure to report, um, depending on the type of employee. So some organizations impose employment disciplinary action up to and including termination for a failure to report, um, depending on the person's motivations. And um, depending on the mandated reporter's profession, there could also be uh, professional licensure um, implications if a person fails to report. So that would really be up to the board or the agency that oversees that person's professional license. Um, and it would be very fact dependent on, um, on the situation. Um, and depending on whether or not uh, that failure to report would constitute unprofessional conduct pursuant to that um, person's license. And then um, it also is possible uh, that the mandated reporter statute could create a private um, civil right of action for a person that was harmed by um, a mandated reporter's failure to report. 
Um, there, there is a provision in the restatement of torts that if there is a legislative um, provision that protects a class of people by requiring certain conduct, but it doesn't um, indicate whether or not there is a private civil right of action, a court can find that there is um, a suitable tort action that was available to a person who's been harmed um, or create another cause of action that's analogous to an existing tort action. Um, and the Vermont Supreme Court has, um, has said that they have not ruled on this issue about whether or not there is a private civil right of action. Um, in 2018, they ruled that they haven't made that determination and they, um, and they declined to make that determination in a, in a case that was before them in 2018. Um, but they did note that <clears throat> there really is a split um, of authority in, in other jurisdictions about whether or not the mandated reporter statute um, implies a private right of action for civil damages against a person who's failed to report. Thank you. Um, the, the, this is an area that both of our committees have worked on in the past. So I think we're, we'll probably be working on it again. Uh, I think Senator Sears, I think, well, I, did, I think, yeah, I think there's two areas to look at for the future, Brennan, maybe even thinking about drafting. One is it's very difficult to, I would imagine, to prove intent to conceal. <clears throat> and I think we should look at that particular um, criminal, but I think maybe we need to make clear that there is a civil case against someone who fails to report that, that, it, that they could um, create a civil cause of action. And secondly, um, we may want to look at how do we hold an institution accountable that allows that type of um, failure to report? Um, there's allegations that current Hatton's administration itself encourage people not to report. And how could they be held accountable? I'm not asking for answers today. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of drafting something. Understood. Right. No, we got that. Uh, any any other questions of clarification for Bryn? It, it, and I could provide some quick data for, for the committees as well in this area. Um, this is calendar year 2019 data. We do not have 20s all put together yet, um, but. <laughs> 2019, we received um, 20,078 reports to our child protection line. Um, approximately 78% of those came from mandated reporters. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's let's move on. Bryn, thank you very much. Uh, this is really very helpful. Um, let's move on to, and for folks who are signing in, Nelly, I think let's hold the waiting, hold people in the waiting room if they're coming in for the next part of our meeting, uh, just because it interrupts the flow of what we're trying to do. So um, let's uh, turn to Colonel Matt Birmingham um, and Dick, uh, Senator Sears, you um, should probably introduce uh, the topic. Oh, well, yeah. Colonel Birmingham and I had uh, a number of discussions about Manhattan, and <clears throat> the main question is the allegations during our work uh, and what we heard in the joint hearing, as well as in uh, Senate Judiciary, was that in a number of cases, the same trooper um, was returning kids who had run away from Manhattan back to the facility, um, and um, the uh, children claim that they ran away because they were afraid of being either sexually or physically abused by Mr. Davis. <clears throat> and I wondered about any of that, but also other runaways who claimed that they had been abused. Did they talk to the officer? I know that when I had kids run away from 204, it was frequent that they would say things, some of it true, some of it not. They would tell the officer or whoever picked them up, maybe their social worker or even a staff member like myself certain things that we were not aware of, some of those truths. So I asked the Colonel if he could go back and look at the records, but also maybe a little bit of information about how <clears throat> runaways are handled by the Vermont State Police. 
Thank you. Thank you, Thank Senator. You, Colonel. Uh, for the record, I'm Matt Birmingham, the director of the Vermont State Police. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with all of you. Um, just for a little background, the state police has uh, specially trained investigators assigned to the special investigation units around the state um, that deal uh, solely with allegations of physical and sexual abuse against children. So we work very closely with uh, DCF on those investigations that are criminal in nature. Um, also for the record, troopers are all mandatory reporters under the law uh, and are required to report any allegations of a child physical or sexual abuse. Um, specifically to Kern Hatton, I've run a couple of numbers since January of 2017. Um, uh, in that time frame, uh, we, the state police investigated no cases of runaway juveniles between that time from Kern Hatton, uh, but there were five active investigations by our criminal investigators um, related to, uh, all, uh, four of them were all child on child uh, <coughs> sexual assault allegations. Uh, and then one is um, actually ongoing as we speak. So um, there, um, and that's from 2017 on. The concern obviously about the trooper that Senator Sears was talking about in the, in the 80s uh, related to um, the allegations back then, I don't have specific information at this point on that. Uh, certainly uh, we, you know, there are, as far as I know, there are no, no troopers that are currently still employed um, with the state police from the 80s. Um, and it would be important for me to, to um, dig into those records, which are all paper files at this point. So it will take time um, to do so and identify which trooper uh, that could have been operating down there at the time. We obviously didn't have um, special investigators at that time, nor do we have SIUs uh, at that time and handled um, complaints very differently. So that's still underway and it will take some time to figure out um, who that may have been at the time, but certainly something we are uh, interested in, in ensuring that, um, you know, we, we get to the bottom of whether or not that, that was true or not at the time. Um, so that's what I have for you. Uh, currently, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions um, from our end. Um, you know, obviously, when we receive any allegation of, of physical or, or sexual abuse of a child, uh, we are we do we notify DCF as does everyone, and then um, our SIUs are uh, are immediately assigned and involved in any criminal allegations from from there on out. And, and criminal investigators work very closely with the DCF investigators on those cases, uh, and present those cases to the state's attorneys in the respective counties for uh, prosecution. Uh, they are specially trained. They go through child forensic um, training uh, courses to, to learn how to interview uh, child victims um, and learn how to uh, do those types of investigations, which are very sensitive um, and require um, a very different approach than many other criminal investigations that we're involved in. I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions. I, I'd have a quick question, but Senator Sears, you go first. No, you go. Well, I was just going to ask if what if uh, in terms of either the training or the uh, the contacts with um, kids and uh, other other folks involved are do you work with DCF on this and um, and then because I, I obviously you do work with DCF on this but in terms of the training process and then uh, the investigation process, how closely and in, under what conditions do you work with um, DCF and social workers and so on? Uh, uh, as close as it gets, we're, we're, we work uh, sometimes in the same uh, offices. We work um, right alongside their investigators uh, in these SIUs around the state. Um, you know, and troopers are mandatory reporters. So re regardless of you know, if, if a complaint comes in and, and regardless of how it comes into the state police, we're required to notify DCF on any allegation of abuse of a child. Um, and they at times can handle uh, some of those reports on their own. Um, and then sometimes if, if there are criminal allegations, they will come back to the state police and the SIUs. And, and then we will work uh, right alongside DCF investigators um, uh, in, on those investigations. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sears, you're up. Yeah. yeah, I guess my question, Colonel, is, is I'm assuming that the uh, four cases of child on child sexual conduct were decided not to be prosecuted by the state's attorney. 
Am I correct um, that um, those are three? Three of them were declined, and one was prosecuted. And the ongoing investigation may or may not be prosecuted. Correct. That is ongoing. Everything so, is written, no matter what you do. Every the decision of whether to charge or not is actually with the state attorney in Wyndham County, not the attorney general. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. The um, all of those cases that I spoke of, uh, except the one that's ongoing, which I assume is also being uh, closely reviewed by the state's attorney, uh, were reviewed by the state's attorney, and and uh, three were declined, and one was prosecuted. Uh, but these these SIUs uh, work very closely with the state's attorneys and their staff and and have, um, in many cases, specific prosecutors that are assigned to prosecute these cases um, as well, because as as the um, as I said previously, the, the investigation of these cases is very, very sensitive and requires uh, special training, as does the prosecution of them. So um, there are many prosecutors designated around the state to, to oversee and manage the, that, that caseload. I think it's important also to understand that many of our uh, child sex abuse laws were updated in, I'm going to say it was 2010, um, following the Bennett case, it was Act 1 of that year, and that uh, changed a lot of what has happened. So I think we may have lost uh, And so when we're looking back to the 80s, that was well before a lot of those changes were made. That nobody needs to comment. I just think it's important to understand that a number of changes have taken place. Uh, I think Senator Hardy has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Colonel, for being here today. Um, you gave us statistics about investigations since 2017. Was there is that is there a reason for that? Or do you have information on investigations prior to that is one question. And the second question is, you said you work very closely with DCF on these types of investigations and matters. And I'm wondering if at any point you've seen, you saw a sort of pattern that concerned you. We, we did hear from Commissioner Brown that, that DCF had concerns. And I'm wondering if, if your people also had concerns and if you did see a pattern or see a pattern anywhere else at, at any other place, how do you, what do you do when you start to see a pattern where there are repeated cases or, or yeah, situations? Um, so the first uh, question, uh, 2017 was uh, probably an arbitrary date that uh, uh, people that I asked to look into this look back. I've so, certainly we can go back as far as um, our our CAD RMS records go, which is probably back to 1992 and I can pull those easily. Prior to 1992, which is when our current CAD RMS, which is our uh, computer uh, records management system, went online, everything is in paper files, which are in storage. So it's much harder to access that information. But certainly, I can go deeper than 2017 if you like. It was a, it was really, I think, just a snapshot in time. Um, to your second question, um, you know, I, that's that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I certainly, you know, that would probably be uh, the local SIU investigative team and the supervisory um, um, oversight of both the criminal investigators and DCS side of the house, um, whether or not they feel there is a, a um, some sort of trend or some sort of issue that that uh, they want to highlight. Um, and I would leave it up to the local investigative teams to 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 do so, um, you know, uh, because all of these, uh, you know, the current one I can't get into, but the the four prior to were child on child. There certainly was no um, nothing, no red flags that I was aware of that that were raised about um, ch child physical or sexual abuse by staff or or adults at the facility. Um, and certainly if, if that was the case, we, we would probably be having, you know, that would raise a lot more red flags. Um, uh, but I, I, I would leave that up to the local investigators and, um, and supervisors to, to manage um, if, they, if they feel there's some sort of issue that, that really needs attention. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, I'm sure that this, again, we're, there'll be a lot of other questions. And as we look back uh, on the, what's, what's been reported by those involved at Kern Hatton, we're, we're gonna wanna know more. And I think some of this um, does relate to the 
<laughs> to the role of the mandatory reporter and some of it actually you know does relate to how to collate the information and determine whether or not it's actionable so um senator sears i think that this probably is a good time to wrap um and i before we do that i i wanted to thank commissioner brown and colonel birmingham and your your staff who are here or who are not here. But I especially want to thank um, Katie McClinn, who had to leave for putting this all together with me. Uh, we did an, a bit of planning on this and Senator Sears as well. So um, I think that's it. This is not the end. Uh, this is the beginning again, another beginning, but we have a lot of questions and really appreciative that the um, department has identified some gaps and and as we go forward together uh, continue to identify the gaps that need closure both in public safety and department of children and families and then extending into the agency of education so thank you all um this will be the zoom room for uh health and welfare so we're going to take a five minute stretch uh, we'll end the, the joint meeting with judiciary and then any judiciary members who would like to stick with us, you're welcome to be here. Uh, <laughs> see, you're all excited about it. Yeah, hopefully all the judiciary members will come <laughs> over to the judiciary Zoom with Peggy Delaney um, at 10.15, we're scheduled to start. So uh, okay. we've got we're, time we're... To, to move to a different room. Um, yeah, walk down the hall. Yeah, walk down the hall. Um, judiciary is right around the corner from health and welfare if you need directions. All we need is a door between the two committee rooms. We'll be yeah. all set. All right, take care. Thank you all.